I give the floor to Florent Mermillo Blondin, who is a research director in the, uh, the laboratory of eco, natural ecosystems and hydrology. He, disc, he talks about the role of ex, the, the exchange of uh, surface and groundwater systems. And he's already attended uh, webinar number one on drinking water and underground water, groundwater. Uh, he had a presentation of the, the uh, Crepish Army catchment base uh, field and we discussed it yesterday and today he will talk about the result of our of uh, uh, research projects the impact of centralized infusion systems on groundwater and that will stop sharing and florian you do have the floor thank you let me talk about the management of uh, rainwater in urban environment and the impact of uh, Infiltration centralized techniques of groundwater. So Pierre Marmonnier worked with me in the same lab, who is now a prof the professor emeritus who worked on this, and Lucie Pinasso, who worked, uh, did a PhD on those uh, topics. But of course, I could have put, um, I could have added many other names. Uh, the, the works can be uh, carried out thanks to the uh, Urban Hydrology Laboratory Observation Lab. So we do have sites, facilities, equipment. We we can carry out this type of work in Lyon. It's a great opportunity uh, to be able to uh, so to do this. So when we talk about the infiltr centralized efficient techniques, well, the, the the context of such a system, well, they simply well, we talk about the impermeabilization of of grounds due to urban development on the left hand side a normal countryside if you want you know there will be infiltration deep infiltration up to 25 percent when it fall when fall only 10 percent of runoffs and there is evapotranspiration in town there is a completely different pattern that is basically there is an in, a high increase of runoffs because of the uh, impervious surfaces and little deep infiltration Therefore, the result is that in urban um, environment, the water cycle is uh, significantly uh, disturbed. There could be runoffs, as we've seen in, in Montpellier, like floods, flash floods during storms in, in town because the runoffs are huge, and the reduction of the recharge of groundwater tables because water go runs off and ends up in a river or in, uh, in, the, uh, in the sea and not in the ground. So the objective of centralized techniques was to collect and infiltrate artificially rainwater. And for years now in Lyon, we've been doing this, uh, we've been using this system uh, with a separative uh, uh, system between the rainwater and wastewater. The principle is to collect water when uh, during a rainfall event in the impervious zone, we collect all the runoffs and we direct them to systems. They could be rivers, but they could also be uh, infiltration basins. This is what I will talk about. Or this water will also infiltrate through a non-saturated zone to reach the groundwater table, which is a saturate, water saturated zone, as you know, with potentially a significant recharging of the ground table. Then there is a high increase of the flows from the surface to the table. We will infiltrate high vo water volumes through the short infiltration basin. We will increase the flows from surface to the ground to the table. And the objectives we had in our project was to, was to look at the consequences of this on the quality of water and on the operation of the groundwater table. I will discuss now um, four points. I will discuss four points, basically. First one, you know, what is the methodology uh, to be implemented and how do we measure this uh, impact of infiltration? I'll talk about the dynamics that could be obtained in terms of uh, urban contaminants or pollutant organic matter and the role of the ground and the non-saturated zone above the groundwater table, uh, the impact on the transfer. Then I will talk about microbiology and I will discuss you know, pesticides and uh, pharmaceutical residues. So this is an infiltration basin 
and this is how it functions while well, you got the running runoff waters which are infiltrated into the table the, it will go from left to right on your screen so you know the groundwater table are always flowing in one direction when you infiltrate it will create some kind of a, what we call a rainfall infiltration plume that will mix with the groundwater table and which will impact the um, the uh, groundwater table uh, we've been able to equip the uh, sites with reference piezometers, hydraulic of the infiltration basin, the not infiltrated by the uh, and the impact, non-impacted and impacted piezometers, which are directly into the rainfall, into the runoff um, plume, and which make it possible to measure the impact on the groundwater table. Now, this is the kind of results we that can be achieved just to uh, show you the impact of this kind of practice. These are recording uh, in electrical conductivity. Electrical conductivity basically is the ion uh, charge, uh, condu conducive ions, and the rainwaters, because they are rainwaters, they have low minerality with very weak. Uh, electrical conductivity, uh, unlike uh, groundwater table, table uh, ground water, which has charged with minerals. So when you see this uh, recording in electrical conductivity, a non impactivity uh, ground uh, table, you see, is between 700 and 800. But here you can see upstream from the infiltration basin here in red, a basin that will receive the rainfall, the rainwater. Each time there is a rainfall here in blue, there is a drop, a significant drop of electrical conductivity due to the input of uh, low minerality water in the table. It changes the conductivity of the nap in an environment which basically is fairly stable throughout the year. We realize that this is causes significant changes at the physical chemical level, and this could have impacts on biology. Because if you change the electrical conductivity, you change the osmolarity of water, and you may also impact the organisms. So this is the kind of pattern we see for electrical conductivity. But bear in mind that if we were to measure temperature, when there, there is a winter rainfall, they tend to cool down the table, whereas summer uh, waterfalls, uh, rainfalls will uh, warm up the uh, table and there will be a significant thermal impact. So back to this electrical conductivity, the advantage of having electrical conductivity that will drop significantly, sharply, means that we can quantify the uh, speed at which surface water reaches the table. So each time we have a drop associated with the rainfall, we can know between the rainfall and the, the smallest uh, the smallest uh, conductivity, uh, electrical conductivity, well, we can calculate the transit time from surface to the table. Now, if we look at the contamination in the table, and now we look at heavy metals and uh, uh, polycyclic uh, uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, you know, the PAH, uh, due to the road traffic, uh, car traffic, you know, those uh, heavy metals and PAH, at least in Lyon, uh, there is a very efficient retention or, or catchment of these metals and hydrocarbons in the ground. Uh, they will be uh, blocked by, uh, retained in the sediment before they reach the table. So we always had very low concentration in uh, heavy metals and uh, pH at the, in the table, but uh, runoff waters may also contain organic matters, uh, be they related to contaminant pollutants or natural organic matters or, you know, vegetation waste. Uh, and we, we knew less things, but we knew, we knew little about this organic, this old organic matter, the DON, but this is, uh, limits the functioning of the uh, groundwater table in Lyon, we realized that, uh, for example, there is a, a biology of microorganisms on invertebrates who actually are alive thanks to the uh, enrichment with organic matter into the table. So we wanted to know if there were orange enrichment in organic matter in the table due to this infiltration. 
we did several experiments. So this is an experiment we did during which we worked on three infiltration sites during a rainfall event. And we wanted to measure the uh, content in organic matter present in the uh, input uh, in the input water in the zone impacted by the basin and upstream from the basin. Less impacted, bearing in mind that organic matter will go through several processes that will lower the organic matter content when it is transferred, either a desorption phenomena or biological degradation. And the results we observed here, as you see the three basins here, you see the uh, dissolved organic carbon, which is the organic matter which has been dissolved, which is transferred with water. And this is purely the fraction that is biodegradable, that which can be used by bacteria. And we realized that between the runoff waters and the impacted uh, groundwater table, there is a significant abatement of the quantity of organic matter, but clearly processes do take place in this zone and will somewhat minimize the contamination of the table with, by organic matters. And it is especially true with the biodegradable dissolved organic carbon because the biological degradation during water transfer through microorganisms, which will use this uh, dissolved organic carbon, which can easily be used and they will lower its concentration or content during the transfer. So now, anyway, uh, in such system, there is contamination uh, in organic matter in the table, even though we have significant abatement. And therefore, when we wanted to do the same experiment by looking at the upstream of the, base, the catchment basin and downstream in the non-impacted and impacted zone, we realized that in the three basins, the same basins, there is an enrichment, significant enrichment in dissolve, biodegradable organic dissolve carbon with concentration, which are always lower than the, uh, you know, the, 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 the value, but uh, given value, but still enrichment exists or happens. Now, we wanted to look into the systems to see if the in input of uh, organic matter and carbon was going to modify the bio microbiology of the table. And if there is a limited carbon uh, content, so if there is an enrichment in dissolved carbon, it should enclose uh, microbiological changes. And to study this, we did artificial substrates. So we were able to in, uh, in place directly uh, into the piezometer tubes. And we could see in the runoff waters, we could do this type of incubation. And we did measure the growth of biomasses in these uh, media using m m protein, micro so very much like the carbon uh, biodegradable. There is a significant increase of the microbial growth in the car in the in the matter but it is uh, significant in the other so to go further we did we did uh, uh, analysis on dna on the microorganisms found to see exactly now do we see a change together with the quantity of microorganisms that will grow of a change of taxon that could be found and we use the dna methods where we can find different groups or bacterial groups and we can actually classify them to get somehow a number of a species we call the operational taxonomic units and they what, what i'm showing you here is the number of bacterial taxa that we found in artificial media placed and just like the biomass, there's an increase, a significant increase in bacterial diversity. So downstream of the basins. So we were expecting, we really thought that this increase in carbon was really going to create the possibility of having a bigger development of microorganisms. And so we tested the relations between the dissolved uh, organic uh, matter at the bottom of the basin with this uh, richness or wealth. And if we look at the number of OTUs presented according to the quantity of dissolved organic carbon, we've got a line telling us that the more dissolved matter we have brought in, then the higher the number of large bacteria that can develop. And it's the same for different uh, groups like bacteriodetes, 
so large bacteria or alpha proteobacteria. So this means that the microbial compartment really does respond well to carbon enrichment, and so it can be used as a bioindicator for the impact of infiltrations, uh, water, uh, rainwater infiltrations on the groundwater. Then we did other work, and we wanted to focus on this non-saturated zone here between the infiltration basin and the groundwater is saturated in water. And as we saw with dissolved organic matter, there is a filter uh, owing to the quantity of carbon in the water table. So we can deteriorate the organic matter with this. So then we wanted to look at the importance, the thickness of the non-saturated zone in terms of the protection of the water table. So the thicker the zone, the more we have protection of the groundwater naturally. And the results obtained really did uh, correspond to this idea. You've got two types of basin. You've got uh, one with a non-saturated zone above 10 meters and another with one that was smaller than 10 meters. And if you look at the dissolved organic carbon that's biodegradable between two basins, there are fewer differences in terms of biodegradable dissolved organic carbon uh, with the first zone than with the second zone. And we obtain the same results for the microbial biomass or for richness in bacteria. In other words, the impact when the, no zone, when the non saturated zone is thick, this protects the water table from organic matter contamination. And it has an effect on microbiology. So we're talking about thickness of these non-saturated zones, but it's really the transit time towards the surface of the uh, groundwater that is important. So you can increase the contact time between the infiltered water with the sedimentary matrix. And it's these exchanges that mean that you've got good retention of organic matter during the transfer of water. So just to go a little bit further, we had a look at what might happen with pesticides and pharmaceutical residue. I know we already had a presentation on this yesterday, but uh, um, I wanted just to uh, go through it a little bit more. So we use a passive samples, so membranes in piezo piezometers that absorb the micropollutants for a specific period with um, different underground water flows. So we then retrieve the membranes, we extract in the laboratory, and we analyze the micropollutants that have accumulated. So the first system gives very low concentration. So if you don't concentrate them, that you're always below the detection ranges. And the second objective, well, initially, we, we were talking about electrical conductivity and that there are lots of variations because of this. So if we want to have something with a, a kind of average sample during rainwater, we have to use this kind of system. We have to try and integrate it. We have to integrate the quantity of contaminants um, that come in with rainfall. So we worked with the University of Portsmouth in order to develop a system that really allows us to go inside the piezometer and to have better contact between this, the water circulating in the piezometers and the membranes that you can see here. So this is the kind of result obtained. So this is an experiment where measurements were carried out on runoff water, on uh, impacted and non-impacted underground water. So we've got uh, 10 samples per type of water on, in different basins. And for the pesticides, you can see that somewhere a little bit everywhere in the impacted groundwater, in the non-impacted groundwater, in the runoff, like the Duran water here. And some, you only found it, you only found in the groundwater, like simazine or atrazine desethyl. So globally, you find pesticides more in the groundwater. 
there are many points where you find pesticides at the surface. Even if you do find some, uh, you can see the examples here. Uh, so in surface water or runoff water. So when we look at pharmaceutical residue, uh, you can see that uh, there are quite a lot. We weren't expecting this diversity. There are some, well, these are not pharmaceutical residue examples, really. Caffeine allows us to trace contamination. You've got them in all, each compartment. You've got caffeine in each compartment. And in fact, there are a lot of, there is a lot of residue in runoff water but a lot less in groundwater, with the exception of some. So we can go further. We wanted to look at different basins. We wanted to see what was really contaminating the water table. So to do this, we looked at four sites and we realized that for 10 day incubations on four sites, there were four components that we found substantially downstream of the basins. So this is the reference in blue and orange. We've got the impacted system. So you carbendazim, lamotrigin, fluopuram, and diuron. These are three, uh, so we've got three pesticides and a pharmaceutical residue. So the pesticides that were probably used in the past and that we're still finding in the ground. Uh, you know, every time it rains, uh, they they come to the fore. And more surprisingly, let's say more surprisingly, we realized that the basins can also have a beneficial effect. In other words, the three components for which the infiltration of rainwater has an effect on the quantities found in the capture systems. Uh, so we find them on the membrane. So atrazine, diethyl atrazine, and simazine. So these are components that you can find in groundwater only. So if you infilter water that doesn't have these components, you realize that the infiltration with this kind of system dilutes contaminants that have been at the water table, probably well for atrazine. You know, it's been forbidden for 10 years now, but there there are still considerable stocks, concentrations in, in the ground. So there's a, a benefit from infiltration, therefore. So if we come to our conclusions now, so what I've shown you is that we've got a methodology that's really very suitable for assessing the impact of infiltration systems on groundwater. The non-saturated zone is a great uh, filter for limiting the transfer of urban contaminants, so heavy metals, but also hydrocarbons. And we've got an enrichment in terms of organic matter that's dissolved, so that's associated with the infiltration. And when you have this enrichment, associated with infiltration, there's an increase in the growth and diversity of microorganisms. But this, of course, can be used, uh, thanks to our artificial systems, as indicators. And concerning pesticides and pharmaceutical residue, you can have negative effects. You can have arrivals of contaminants in the groundwater, but also the, you know, the water might be not as uh, charged as uh, the groundwater. So just to continue then, so we drew up an operational guide last year during, as part of the ANR frog. This was to summarize all of the activities that we'd been involved with, uh, focusing on um, groundwater. We looked at the impacts of uh, centralized infiltration structures. Uh, we went through the characteristics of basins able to influence uh, these impacts on uh, the water table with recommendations for monitoring these uh, areas, you know, recommendations uh, in terms of research as well. So this operational guide, it's something that you can find, well, on the PDF here, but also on the grey uh, website. So you can also find in the guide information about the impact 
of the urban surface, how this um, impacts uh, the, the impermeability of the uh, water table, and especially when it comes to uh, temperature differences. So when there's a, an increase in temperature, it's, it, it's like draining a watershed. So that's why it's good to have source infiltration systems, because they're going to have less of an impact on the temperature of the water table, you know, because when you heat the water table, you're going to have an impact on microbiology there, and this leads to different risks that need to be managed. There are other results as well. Uh, you can look at different approaches. In these watersheds, you've often got an accumulation of a highly contaminated fine sediment. So we know that there are some organisms that can uh, clog up basins, plants, or invertebrate uh, creatures. They can also deteriorate the organic matter and, and they might, you know, contribute to the buildup of, of heavy metals. So you can also find quite a lot of information about, well, not everything, but uh, quite a lot of what was developed as part of the OTHU. So with recommendations with respect to monitoring. So uh, this brings me to the end. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. So we'll finish with uh, a few sites. There are probably other sites that are more natural than these, but they're great tools for working on the impact of cities and rainwater on our water table. Thank you. So we can move on to the next presentation. Mr. Hervé Catran, who is in charge of the uh, heritage management at the Environment and Transition Delegation for the Metropolitan Authority in Lyon. Today, he's going to be presenting to us the Lyon project as a, a, an impermeable city. It's something that he's been following for a long time now. The aim is to limit the uh, entrance of rainwater into these sewerage networks. Um, yes, hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. So I'm going to be presenting to you this project, this uh, a permeable city project that we've been working on in the metropolitan area of Lyon. So my presentation will focus on two, three points. Uh, I'll quickly uh, present to you the metropolitan area of Lyon and the context uh, that we're talking about. I'll talk to you a little bit about this permeable city project, and then I will show you how we can um, De de impermeabilize a, a city. So the metropolitan area of Lyon, 1.37 million inhabitants, 59 municipalities. So it's a very big area with something like over 3,000 kilometers of networks. And there's something that's quite specific, uh, something concerning the urban center. We're talking about um, combined uh, systems. We've got 1,800 kilometers of combined systems, and we've got a mixture between wastewater and rainwater in these combined uh, sewage systems. And of course, uh, this represents quite a few problems. There are there is a part where we, you know, nearly 1,000 kilometers where it's just for wastewater, and f over 400 kilometers of uh, system where it's just rainwater. And I'd just like to draw your attention to a, a, a small point. Sometimes these rainwater networks where we've got a separation, they are reconnected a little bit more downstream of the basin directly uh, into the combined system because we don't, we can't always have natural outlets, so to speak. So we've been talking about uh, sealing in previous presentations. So just to, to illustrate what's happening, when it comes to you know artificial um, ground, so this concerns uh, you know urban planning, urban development, constructions, but also certain intense farming practices um, leading to runoff. Anyway, just to show you what's happened between 1955 and 2015, you can see the illustration here. Uh, this is the metropolitan area, so between Lyon, Saint-Étienne, Grenoble, etc. You can see the red dots show how 
much of the area has become artificial. So between 2005 and 2015, 10,000 hectares became artificial. Uh, and 7,000 hectares were just for residential purposes. So I won't go back over what's already been shown to you with respect to the radical modification of, of runoff systems when you have these artificial uh, sealed systems. Let me just, you know, we've got the same, I've got the same figures as the previous speaker, in fact. So I'd like to insist on the 55%, however, to, this is a, a neighborhood in the city where runoff represents 80 to 90 percent, depending on, um, you know, how far the neighborhood is sealed. So we've been talking about floods and we're seeing floods here in these pictures because of, of the, the sealed uh, ground, the sealed pavements uh, that are not at all uh, permeable. So you can see the floods that, that date back to last year. There's another problem when, when you have these rain the rainwater going into the sewage system you've you've got the combined systems that overflow and on this map if you have a look you can see the little green areas that represent the sewage system of the metropolitan area all of the red dots represent overflows that have happened and that happen on a regular basis so there's this uh, runoff problem, this uh, overflow problem in cities. We've talked about the difficulty of recharging the water table when you've got soil that is sealed, when you've got ground that is sealed. And if, you know, sewage systems, if we don't want them to be under too much pressure, you've got to have stormwater outlets that take wastewater and um, rainwater into the natural environment and that leads to pollution of that natural environment. So given this observation, what are we trying to do in Lyon uh, with other municipal authorities? We're trying to uh, remove the, per the impermeable nature of these cities, the sealing systems. So we want to have a system where we can manage rainwater via a combined system so that we have a permeable uh, uh, city with different plants and trees. So we've already done source management of rainwater with centralized basins. So we've seen that already. But today we're going to focus on a source, a very localized source management with very small facilities. And I will explain to you what these facilities look like. So all of this in a context of climate change where you're going to have considerable modifications of, of the rain uh, flows. So if you want to have, you know, something that's uh, mineral, if you want to move from a mineral city to a, a city where things are not all sealed off, then it's important to create different things. For example, um, urban freshness islands. You've got to limit flooding you've got to recharge the water table. We've talked about that. And there's another objective, and that is to try and reach objectives that are set by the um, water framework directive, where you limit the outflows of sewage systems. We also have other objective that is cost control, because if you want to manage uh, rainfall events, which uh, we're going to be uh, more and more severe, we need ne we need uh, larger networks. You need combined networks, and therefore there will be expensive works, and their operations will be expensive too. And as you will see, uh, there is one objective: is to increase or try to increase the uh, biodiversity in town. In my talk, I want to clarify this differentiate two things. First, the city which spreads. Uh, in its periphery or will rebuild itself. Well, this part of the city, can be, we can control the, uh, the impermeabilization of the city with using uh, regulations, you know, uh, uh, building permits, or uh, which will mean that there will be deconnection or the impermeabilization of the city. And there is a location where it's more difficult to act. It is in the existing city 
where there is no develop, major development project. So there will be urban centers where the, uh, there will be such space will be constrained and many things happen in such space. And it is in this part that I will essentially concentrate my focus my talk. And this is where our, this is where the issues uh, are for the road. A oh, quick presentation of the Greater Lyon and of the context. Now, if you talk about the permeable city project, what is it? Well, this is that was initiated in 2015. Uh, between 2015 and 2020, there was the first phase of work to assess all the achievements, all the projects conducted in Lyon with works for the uh, rainy, dealing with. Uh, rainwater at the source. So often we said that those are works that do not work well, they're not efficient and so on and so forth. So we wanted to look at uh, works done more than 20 years ago and see how they uh, were operating, were they operational, efficient or not. So we went to see this to try to identify the success and the failures, you know, what did work or did not. And to put around the table, around those works, all the various departments which are active in the construction of the city, the people with cleanliness, builder, urban developers, road maintenance, uh, street maintenance, and water management, and those who also deal with green spaces. So that's a real analysis work in order to be able to to uh, come up, to come uh, to guide the next projects, you know, with great ideas. And in addition, I was talking about the regulatory procedures. Well, there is a regulatory framework which has been done and transcribed into the uh, local urban plan and in the uh, sanitation service uh, plan. And today in Lyon, when we want, if uh, new urban spaces or new dwellings are being built, it is prohibited in most cases to uh, reject uh, rainwater to the sanitation system. So we are forcing all new uh, urban developers to uh, modify the permeability of the ground or to, to channel their rainwaters. This is now strongly specified in the regulation. So in 2020, about 100 hectares have been de-impermeabilized in the metro metropole. And based on the experience we had in the last five years, we've moved to phase two, of this permeable city that will stretch or through between 2020 and 2026. And we are going to, well, we are developing a strategy that we are implementing now. There will be the two elements I was mentioning, the two uh, axes to build the city, which is being renewed or which will expand with new districts and the existing city. In this part here, we will, there will be little action because the new regulation will govern the uh, subsequent issues of uh, impermeabilization of the city. So uh, the water management, we, for example, we define programs that will be given to the developers, urban developers, and in the programs it explained that they should not impermeabilize and will give new construction rules, uh, new management rules for the rain. Uh, for the rainwater and so on and so forth. So we are going to force the management of public space. You know, we act by managing the rainwater network at the source. Now, the second part which mentioned is in the existing city, in the in the heritage city. Uh, yet there we will, you know, they will do a uh, redo a crossroad, a uh, chunk of the road. So what are we going to do in such places? Well, we propose to work based on several uh, leads. First, to create rain trees. I'll come back to talk to you about to explain that. So whenever we do something up on the road, on the streets, in the high schools, secondary schools, in uh, you know, in the buildings in the metropoles, well, we'll think systematically about a way to de-impermeabilize the city and disconnect the two systems. So. Something which is quite uh, complicated but interesting is to integrate all those de impermeation policies in all public policies, urban public policies, so as to work in a fully transversal cross cutting way with a par participative development to see how we can associate citizens to de impermeabilization. 
because the city is something that belongs to the citizen and they have a key role to play. Now, something quite innovative, and uh, there will be a, di a discussion taken by the discussion uh, and decision made by all uh, uh, elected officials for the metropole. And they will launch a huge depermalization project, and the objective is to achieve 400 hectares of permeable disconnected uh, hectares so to manage rainwater runoffs i was talking about the integration in the public policies for the last few years now well about well five years five years strong work's been done about this notion of permeable cities especially with the canopy plan and the nature plan the canopy plan while this comes from the uh, uh, tree charter, which is there to protect and expand vegetation, especially trees in town, and to create an urban forest. Likewise for nature, how are we going to uh, recreate nature uh, in, in the urban earth plan, which is important. You know, the, this, the, this is clim plant climate air energy to, to be adapted to the climate change. So water, will be a key factor in the canopy plan since the development of vegetation in town needs calls for water and water needs the development of vegetation in town as we saw earlier on with the roots of the trees and the vegetation of plants the fauna of the of the ground which facilitated the infiltration and the better management of water today where do we stand following the first phase well as i said we deimpermeabilized or disconnected about 100 hectares. So you can see on this map all the spots in red or you know lines, which are sectors which have been made permeable. And you they found them in the east of the town because uh, the land, the terrain is is uh, lends itself to water infiltration. Well, there are porous structures, you know, they could be uh, structures that will allow water to seep uh, seep through them or infiltrate to them or there will be infiltration ditches where water what rainwater is collected uh, they also uh, you see ditches that will collect the uh, rainwater and infiltration uh, basin now how do we manage water in such systems well it is a system that is very simple we have to basically restore the natural water cycle by simple means to manage rainwater. That is, we will try to have a hole in the ground and put the water in the hole and let water enter the ground. So there will be uh, uh, things more technical like porous coating or vegetalized ponds, you know, uh, ditches and others or, you know, and uh, and the uh, rain garden and the Stockholm uh, ditches and the vegetalized roofs. So these are open sky uh, basins. We we all push them early on. They they may be more vegetalized for you know Porte des Alpes and Priestre, Parc du Vallon, the Minerva uh, basin or the Jacques Kaplan basin right in the center of Lyon. You see the La Partie Tower, so we are right in the in, in urban center, and we've been able to uh, control spaces like in here at the periphery of the city because in this uh, in this uh, zone here in the Jacob Kaplan Park, well, the metropole was able to control several like, tens of hectares to do these works, which will take a lot of space actually. So a more simple uh, thing like this uh, infiltration ditch, you see, where we will collect the rainwater through runoffs, especially uh, the, next to the uh, rain, the cycle tracks or close to the road here, you see in saint Priest, you see, nothing very complicated, you see, road from the street will uh, run off and be, be infiltrated into so before going into the ground and reach the table. Concerning those uh, water, you see the rain collection uh, trenches, you see, collecting the rainwater from the streets or for the pedestrian zones for infiltration in, th you know, in things which are more vegetalized than what I saw the, showed early on. Again, this will be easily done because when we, it's easy when you got a space available. This is a, this is a former 
uh, Army Barrack, which has been re uh, redeveloped. In Ula, it was the development of a major sector where we can really think about it, you know, upstream and to have space to do those developments, which uh, actually take a lot of space. Now, more detailed aspect, garden, rain garden, these are more urban centers, you know, spaces are smaller and we can measure rainwater, but still the principle is the same, collecting rainwater through uh, in a, to a system. And it is then guided to spaces which are slightly lower where we can uh, grow vegetables to have qualitative things with uh, uh, plantations, which are more or less interesting and water will infiltrate directly into the ground. This is an example in the axiere and uh, in Vaux-en-Velin on the uh, city center, Zach, the road uh, work is not finished. We collect water via these uh, runoffs and it goes into this uh, system where we've done plantation there and it will store a certain quantity of water that will feed vegetation. And, uh, and if it rains too much, the water level will rise, go through the grid, to the grid go to a pipe in, up to a retention and efficient basin. Other example, vegetalize the roofs with simple earth on the, or gravel with uh, low vegetation or things more complicated, sophisticated, like the prefabricated plastic uh, boxes in which we collect rainwater and this rainwater will come up via uh, into all the boxes placed on the top in which there is vegetation. So you see here, we're working on uh, quite a lot on biodiversity, vegetal biodiversity and everything that can be actually, uh, we reach another objective and porous material. Uh, so as you see here in the Liseron Boulevard where there is a cycle tracks and the uh, rainwater will infiltrate our parking lots, which are found, which are porous, which can be vegetalized, or you know, live left with gravel and water will penetrate that. Just a quick uh, rapid zoom because I'm getting to the end of my 25 minutes. So we are now developing a concept called the the climate change adaptation solution, nature-based climate change adaptation solution. So. This is something that has been developed by the International Union of Nature Conservation. The idea is to, uh, re, you know, to deal with issues such as floods or uh, hot spots, you know, or hot uh, islands, uh, heat island, by re recreating nature or re by creating or recreating or improving ecosystem. That's why we want to talk or talk about nature-based solutions. So we want to work on the management of rainwater with the, the tr trees and use the trees as a cooling for the cooling potential of a tree via its roots, where we'll pump water into the ground. It will do an evapotranspiration. And by doing so, it will somewhat cool down the atmosphere. So it will, it, this will consume the air. And through the shade, the shade it, friction, it it cools down the temperature. So it, it helps in the climate, the, uh, the, uh, the cooling down the city and it, uh, it makes the, the neighborhood more attractive. So we did measurements on the Garibaldi streets and we realized that we can reduce the temperature by nine degrees, uh, which is about the, the uh, uh, which is quite uh, UTCI. So, uh, you know, when the trees are living, living existences, you know, they, when it's too hot, you know, they tend to close their leaves or storm rats to don't want to die of dehydration. So what are we going to do? We're going to force the evapotranspiration of trees by bringing them water when there is a heat wave. So this is what is done in Garibaldi. For example, we collect uh, in all spaces we used by pedestrians and by bicycles and buses where we collect rainwater, which is then sent to you see those uh, basins and water will be infiltrated. And as we saw the other uh, the Leon, when it rains too much, water will go into the, the uh, grids and will come to an underground uh, catchment pond. And this water will then be used in summer to rehydrate 
the uh, to rehydrate the trees and uh, favor evapotranspiration. And this water is also kept to water some green spices in Lyon and to work on the uh, street cleaning. A couple of things to show you. I'm going fast still about so nature-based solutions. You know, the Stockholm trenches, this is quite innovative, which was developed in Sweden. What is it? Basically, it's like a pit in which we mix uh, stones with vegetable uh, earth. It's kind of a skeleton structure where you can actually, you know, uh, park cars, but the earth between the stones will be used for the trees to uh, feed the trees. So those are, these were developed in the 19th centuries in cities and uh, which uh, as time went, you know, slowly disappeared because these, they were fairly expensive to do. And the best was in the eighties when we planted a tree, there was only a pit or one cubic meter on the tree. So now we did this, uh, new uh, ditches or these uh, pits, we can store very little water. And therefore in Stockholm, what did they do? There is a gravel layer uh, to, on the top to store water. When it rains, there is a well, an infiltration well, an aeration well. Water will r go through the well, infiltrates into the uh, pit, and when it rains a lot, the water level will increase, get to this part here, which is old, and water will actually run into the gravels before being reinfiltrated into the ground. The other advantage is that when it doesn't rain, this part of gravel and this opening to the outside will make it possible to have gas exchange between the root system of the tree and the atmosphere. So there is clearly something most interesting there. And the largest example is the Frankfurt Square in front of the Lapardieu train station. There is this square which seems to be uh, mineral, but in fact, below this square, which covers 3,500 square meter, you will see these, uh, these uh, Stockholm pits. You see they will infiltrate between the porous joints and the true, it runs off through via uh, whole pipe systems into this uh, uh, pit, uh, the Stockholm pit. So this is quite innovative and we're trying to import and adapt. And the last point are the rain uh, trees developed in Lyon. So I've showed you on this photo, a typology of trees. So what do we see systematically? We see that the foot of the trees, well, the ecosystems are quite limited, you know, a bit of vegetation, a bit of grass, some waste or littering and, you know, a dog dejection and also. So first thing we see, you know, with a limited space. So when we think about that for rainwater measurements, you know, rainwater will infiltrate there only and the rest will run off. So second thing we see is that is systematically, trees have been planted with hard uh, rims to protect them from the cars and therefore water cannot infiltrate into this space when it rains. As an example, those are a couple of examples for those in a foot, uh, you know, in Lyon, uh, someone's wearing boots and there is a flood and you can see trees actually are completely dry. So not, so another photo here, we can see again, you know, the, the, the circle track, the pedestrian crossing, which is, an, and if you look at the foot of the trees, there is, uh, not a drop of water. So we thought that was a shame to manage the city in such a way, and especially in climate change. Paris. So we've moved to something different and see how we can use these rain trees based on nature. And there's a project called, which is financed by Europe, which is called Artisan, and which is there to develop uh, in local authorities this uh, solution based on nature. And the project was to de-impermeabilize around the trees, you see, and to re-vegetalize with three strats, you know, grass, uh, small trees, bushes, and the trees. So this is an example of the first uh, uh, structures like this made. You can see the space, which is no longer uh, the way it was, and there's been work uh, carried out uh, 
around the foot of the tree. And if you look at this part, there's an infiltration trench that has been built with the borders that have been broken. So the water runs down into the canal. It is stored in the trench. When it's full, it will go into the second tree, the third tree, etc., etc. And as there's a pressure drop here, the water can run off and be stored here. So the idea is to manage of 10 to 15 millimeters of rainwater thanks to these trees. And the advantage is this, of this system is that, you, you know, you do nothing to the existing network. So it, it takes on board uh, some of the rainwater. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening to me, and I am available to answer any questions that you may have. We're going to be listening to Frédéric Parent, who is a research engineer at the Ecole des Mines in Saint-Étienne, where he did his thesis. He works for the Environment and Society Lab, and he works on two different things, on the development of multidisciplinary methods for a better understanding of interactions between ground and surface water and on the monitoring and feedback in terms of restoration management and planning so today he's going to be talk to us about his multidisciplinary methodologies and the transfer of knowledge for practice and for working on groundwater and surface water systems you have the floor, Frederick. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk to you about work that we're carrying out at uh, the Ecole des Mines in Saint-Étienne. Uh, so we've been doing this for 15 years now. So the interactions between ground and surface water, as Florian said right at the beginning, I could have added lots of names to the first uh, slide, but in fact, I've added some appendices to uh, introduce my main colleagues who were involved uh, in the work. So Hervé Chapuis, Didi Graillot, Eric Lallo, Yvan Pascoletti, and Jordan Rebaua. Some were doctoral students, some were postdoctoral students. So from the point of view of um, research support, most of the projects that I will be presenting to you will not have been possible without the ZAR, without the Rhone Mediterranean Corsica Water Agency and the French Agency for Biodiversity. So I'm going to give you a presentation. There will be three parts to it. First of all, I will present to you the theory uh, with respect to the exchanges between uh, surface and groundwater, between rivers and groundwater, and in the different uh, challenges. I've decided to give you an overview rather than go into all of the details. So I'll be talking about six examples that we've worked on the idea being to implement this multidisciplinary methodology to characterize the different types of water. And I will be talking about the way we transferred this knowledge to uh, managers or stakeholders involved. So through methodological guides that we produced. So this interface between surface water and groundwater, what can we say about it? Well, it's something that you, that, it's something that raises problems. There's a critical zone, but there's also the water framework directive that is concerned. So there are significant needs to develop a methodology to characterize the interface, to quantify the exchanges and the water flows. There's a, a real need to understand the phenomena at work but also there's a real need to transfer knowledge to people who are really managing water. In terms of functions and services, this interface can be uh, linked to different biogeochemical functions without even talking about ecosystem services in terms of water storage, in terms of uh, control, water control, and in terms of uh, low water replenishment. So these interfaces are not really very visible when you're out there in the field. What you have to remember is that when it comes to flows, the most frequent relationships are those 
where you have the groundwater feeding uh, waterways and conversely, even if uh, that relationship is less frequent, where you've got surface waters feeding into groundwater. So what, I don't know if you can see everything, but what we're seeing here on the diagram is that when we work on a, a site, often it's a good idea to integrate the site into the hydro system because the water that we're going to work on may follow a complex path, may go through different aquifers and might even be filtered down uh, to certain areas and then go to a different area. So it's good to have tools to allow us to determine the origin of the water and the paths followed by the water. So it's also important to remember that these relationships can vary uh, in terms of space and time, uh, according to the season and the flows, the exchanges can also uh, be the opposite way around. Now there are certain factors notably uh, structures or uh, developments that can modify the exchanges, pumping stations or uh, dams, uh, different structures or uh, ditches, uh, things like that. And at the end of the day, when you have a hydraulic uh, community, there's a big link, there's a strong link when it comes to quantitative and qualitative aspects relating to the water resource itself. So let's talk about the work that was carried out. So the approach was scientific. The idea was to develop a methodology to study the interface and the water exchanges taking place. So and, and the this approach is often multidisciplinary according to the projects. So there are different disciplines uh, involved in order to carry out the diagnosis. And it's also an operational approach uh, where we focus on tools, for example, where we try and transfer our knowledge, and where we try and offer guides that allow water managers to use the tools as best as possible. So as far as possible, we try to co-build these tools with uh, peer reviews, uh, working groups uh, that the water managers are part of. So the first project that I'm going to talk to you about, that I'm going to present to you very quickly, is a project. It's a project where we we're going to work on the interactions between the alluvial water table and rivers. So a big project, therefore, looking at, na uh, at the water table Rhone interaction. So you can see that there are four main tools that can be used to characterize the interactions between the groundwater and the Rhone. So the model, of course, has been simplified, but there are biological indicators, that there are macrophytes, invertebrates, and then tracers chemical traces. So the idea here is to use each of these tools in order to perform a diagnosis. So not only based on the results of each tool, but a diagnosis that will be converging uh, and sometimes diverging. So the um, advantage of combining these different approaches is that when you have a converging diagnosis, you can say, for example, that you have a result with little uncertainty, but if it's diverging, then it means uh, you've got to try and understand why. So in this kind of approach, what we try and do all the time is that for each of the tools, we try and determine as uh, precisely as possible what the type of exchange is, the type of exchange that, can, that characterizes what we're looking at. So there's an awful lot of background work to characterize, to look at types, and to describe all of the possible interactions. So I don't know if you can see it here, but in the table, there are a certain number of tools. You've got the type of configuration uh, that can be used in order to make the diagnosis. In green, you've got what can be diagnosed. In red, you've got uh, what cannot be diagnosed. So at the end of the day, we can obtain this kind of uh, results box. So for the Rhone sector, for the Rhone sector that we focused on, 
we've got the banks of the Rhone down to the um, canal, and when we looked at the different exchanges, these were determined by a cross analysis of the results of each of the measurements taken. So, for example, in green, we've got the sectors where we've got the ground waters feeding into the waterway. And in red, for example, you've got the sectors where it's the Rhone that actually feeds in to the water table. So we've also got tools that allow us to estimate the quantities of water exchange. Now, the figures seem quite high. So for Danzien Mondragon, for example, here there's a, a contribution of the water table that uh, is, you know, almost 9,000 cubic meters per day. It seems a lot. But if you look at the average for the Rhone, it's over 1,000 per second. So these contributions, therefore, these additions are relatively low, therefore. So here's the second project then. So the scale is much broader here because the idea was to determine the interactions between a river in, karstic, in a karstic canyon, so river says. The idea was therefore to determine the interactions between the karstic reservoir and the waterway. So just uh, like in the previous example, there's a whole series of tools that we can use to work on the interactions between surface water and the groundwater. So there are different tools that allow us to make a diagnosis, uh, a broad diagnosis, and then there are other tools that allow us to go uh, down into details. And even if we've got it, and if we've got enough information, we can actually model the interactions between the surface water and the groundwater. So we also have to look at the types of exchanges uh, and decide uh, which tool is the best. So if we want to look at the caustic reservoir contributions, or conversely, we might use one uh, tool. So. These tools allow us to understand the way these exchanges work and to quantify them as well. So that's these are the types of results that can be obtained with a conceptual model that shows us the loss zones and the contribution zones. Thanks to caustic sources in blue, we've got sources that are only made up of groundwater, or, or, and then you've got these little green uh, and orange circles that show as sources where you've got a contribution that's already a mixture between groundwater and surface water. So when at low water levels, so you've got uh, contributions, uh, the caustic contributions to the says which are quite considerable. They can correspond, for example, to 48 to 60 percent of the flow rate of the river. In June 2015, we estimated this contribution in this sector at two cubic meters per second. So it's uh, quite a considerable addition, especially given the Mediterranean context. So here's the second type of result for this sector. Now, thanks to the work carried out, we were able to specify the different types of configurations where uh, you can have interactions between the cast and the river. So different uh, configurations in terms of surface water loss towards the cast or the opposite way around. Contributions, no, sorry. Contributions of the karstic area to the waterway or um, exigences or water filtering down into one area, into the river and then coming back up in another place. So this diagram is the result of several years of work. So here's another example. So we also worked on interactions between groundwater and surface water in wetlands. So this is a different context. So we're working on just the wetland. The objective is to determine the, the ability for a low water replenishment, given that these wetlands are often interacting with the surface waters and groundwaters. So here the objective is really to determine, uh, to see 
to differentiate between the, the share of water stored in the wetland coming from rainwater and then the contributions that are coming from, for example, groundwater. So similarly, just like before, uh, we set up a methodology that's going to allow us to better understand the structure of the wetland, to understand its properties, its hydrodynamic characteristics, as and as well as to choose the tools that allow, are going to allow us to better understand the quantity of water stored in the wetland and the way in which that water is uh, comes out of the wetland. So ge geochemical tools are often used to have a better, a more detailed uh, understanding of the origin and path of the water. So with this smaller sector, you can have this kind of result coming up. So this is simplified and the project will probably be finished by the end of the year, so 2022. So this is where we started to try and understand the different feeding basins for the peatland and the circulation of water between the different reservoirs. So we were also able to estimate the share of uh, peatland contributions to the flow of the river uh, where, where, you, where you have the outlet. So we're looking at flow rates, so low water replenishment of 0 0.06 and 0 0.028 uh, liters per second. So if we think about things relatively, just to give you an example, a flow rate of one liter per second is going to make it possible to ensure to feed uh, drinking water to 600 inhabitants at 150 liters per day and by per uh, inhabitant. So this is something that we're working on at the moment. So this time we're in a different context. It's a little bit more complex, this world. It's the interactions between volcanic aquifers and rivers. Where? So it's a project in the Puy. There's a kind of a, a vanilla slice between uh, um, uh, sludge uh, deposits and other kinds of deposits. So uh, areas that cannot actually store water. So for this project, we built um, a reservoir model. We tried to determine for a, a section to look at all of the different contributions that might be linked to water to or loss linked to evapotranspiration and we tried to uh, assess things per section. So what we realized in fact was that upstream of this sector, for those of you who are familiar with the region of Clermont-Ferrand, this is a waterway that goes via Lac Lake Deda. So upstream of this sector, you've got uh, the initial waterways, the Nasa and Labado, they join to form a, another waterway called La Verre, the Verre, and it only represents 50% of the water arriving in the lake. The rest of the water is linked to underground contributions along the path of the waterway. So we suspect that this water is contained in, in, in lava, uh, old lava. Upstream from the system, we haven't finished the analysis. Uh, we, want to, we haven't yet determined, uh, defined what is under groundwater and uh, surface, but up to 75% of the flow of the river is when there is a low level or low flow. So those are may, some examples. Well, uh, I did talk quickly, but you know, at least uh, they get, show you the various configurations, geological configurations in which the in, uh, you know groundwater, surface water interactions may take place currently. And this will be my last application. We run projects applied to polluted sites and grounds where the study of uh, uh, groundwater, the groundwater table river interaction targets the vulnerability of aquifers and the risk of uh, pollution uh, are either because grounds have been polluted by industrial activities or deposits, uh, you know, dump sites 
which are uh, highly polluting. Those are the applications and projects on which we've been working now for about 15 years, when all the and those are the last ones in progress. Then we did uh, a series of work, a body of work summary, synthesis of these uh, instruments in guides. We wrote guides. So all the reports, all the guides, in fact, are public. They can be downloaded for free. Uh, most of them on the uh, on the as app uh, website. Uh, quick, I'm almost done, so I'll be quick. And we did a first methodological guide, which valorizes work done in the Rhone and in the exchange the, the table Rhone. Uh, uh, exchanges. We worked on the exchange between the uh, tables and alluvial uh, medium or environments. Then uh, we also produced a second guide, which is more technical guide. Uh, we've integrated new instruments and work on the examples, which are not just located in the Rhone basin, but which are more uh, where we got national examples is the Seine River, uh, the uh, Rhone, uh, Rhine River, and also the Sevres Niortes in the center, center west, where we produced for each of the tools. Some are written, which is the first one, but anyway, to produce technical uh, fo uh, forms or technical sheets uh, to make sure that they would be easily uh, usable by water managers and easily uh, usable. And this one was published in 2017. A new guide is about to be published in 2022, which uh, takes stock of the situation uh, on the interactions between hydraulic exchange between casts and rivers. This time, because of the high number of tools and the complexity of the of the casting system, rather than calling it guide, we call it methodological recommendations to give some sort of, to open leads, to understand what the cuts is all about, to better and understand and, and quantify exchange between the cost and the river, what tools to use, how to use them, and how to implement them. All these works have already been transferred to the uh, manager of the SES River, because now they do their monitoring and you know, we train them, now they're, they're autonomous. And this project is now, uh, has been, is, this methodology is being transposed. Uh, there will be a project in the catchment basin of the Ardèche River. So whenever a guide is being published, we organize a seminar with demonstration of uh, tools. We did one for the first two guides. If you're interested, uh, the presentation of the guide on cars will take place on June 14th, in Barjac, uh, during uh, organi this is really organized by the ZAP, the Bassin du Rhône, and, uh, and the Grain. By way of conclusion, well, we did uh, a lot of things. Perspectives uh, to this type of activity, well, we wanted to build uh, training sessions with the water agency. And why not, uh, maybe based on the results of the guides, well, the works in the wet zones and on the interactions between the rivers, uh, volcanic aquifers, why not prepare other guides in the future in this uh, context? And possibly, um, if possible, try to integrate the return of experience and the utilization of the uh, previous uh, guides. Moreover, I forgot to write this in the conclusion, but in the, on the Ardèche project, one of the uh, stake or the challenge would be to try to to do a bit of perspective and to integrate the question of climate change into the characterization of uh, table river interactions and especially when it comes to quantification. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention.
scale, the scale first. Well, I don't know. We got a feeling that in the question you're asking, there is there seem to be opposition between the major basin and micro basin. No, no, this is not an opposition. The major basins can be put outside of the city or inside the city, uh, you know, as we've seen in La Pardieu. And it, it is the space between the two systems, the two major basins, where we can still do micro infiltration. So this micro infiltration also, uh, when we talked about the links with the uh, emicorid and so would that again, these are complicated. I mean, we were just starting, you know, at least we could have some kind of, uh, of uh, tram systems, for example, between, uh, you know, oh, oh sorry, oh, sorry, tra tram uh, of uh, gr uh, gr greed, you know, green, blue, uh, around the, 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 there could be spots, you know, it would be it would be a grid but spot and to establish a link between that and the rivers and the macro slopes and the hydro the global hydrological slope of a natural ground in the city. Well, I think things have been uh, lost. And when we work on uh, the city has been so many reshaped so many times that low points are no longer the low points and that uh, when we talked about the, the reefs which uh, disappeared in Lyon, well, it, we can still find its uh, uh, its run through altimetry and slope. So when I work on the rainwater management, I ignore uh, any uh, address system, uh, previous address system which may have existed. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. We've not looked into these issues. Could we run water on uh, imper impervious surfaces to uh, can I, uh, channel it to lower points and then we could guide the runoffs into an, uh, the natural environment? It is so complicated that uh, I, I cannot answer that yet. The artisan project that they, this is also designed to better understand the evolution of the systems. No, is not the case. Well, for artisan, we do monitoring of what that takes place at the level of quantity, what quantity of water can be infiltrated, what quantity of water can uh, be taken out of the uh, Sanit unitary sanitation network. So we also measure everything that takes place in terms of the permeability of the ground, uh, humidity of the ground. Trees are also equipped to see uh, we, when we do evapotranspiration and we work on biodiversity, vegetal and animal biodiversity. So uh, um, for the time being, we don't do modeling, uh, hydrological modeling to measure the impact uh, of a sanitation network or as we could work on modeling of uh, runoffs. I was thinking also about biodiversity. You know, it depends how far it goes. For example, there is, uh, you know, uh, the fact that they could, there would be several zones. Well, well, in more natural systems, that it make it possible to have scattering between zones or to reconstitute a connectivity, ecological connectivity for some organisms like uh, insects. Uh, you know, these are questions which are, you know, open. There is a group in Montpellier that has worked on this quite a lot in the CEF, I think. I think, uh, so I think there are many, many questions. There are several, there are more questions than answers for the time being, but uh, we hope it will come. Otherwise, for the, the story of having uh, uh, different types of systems, it's most interesting to have a mix. The, the major systems that have shown, in fact, make it possible to recharge the, the layer, but in a very efficient manner, what could be less the case of uh, systems at the source, because we put trees, we put vegetation, so we create evapotranspiration, so we lose a lot of water which will not be reinfiltrated and get to the table. So both, we should find a balance between, uh, will, do we, will we need water in the future? 
we saw yesterday that we there could be a significant drop at the in the Rhone River, which is the main supply for the metropole. Uh, so how can we uh, get all this together and to have policies that will uh, make it possible to um, to be positive in with all the, the potential uh, functions of these works? Of course, when water falls on the ground, part of it goes there, will be evaporated. And especially if it's a mineral black, uh, warm ground, uh, there will be evaporation. But the, we don't want to collect all that water. The objective, actually, one of the main objectives is to, to, to minimize the runoffs in the soil floods and minimize especially the, uh, the uh, outflows of uh, combined uh, networks to minimize pollution. So clearly there is evaporation, but if I limit myself to the objectives of uh, limiting the, uh, the, uh, the loading of the networks and the uh, and floods, uh, well, uh, you'd be, I want water to be evaporated immediately. We are not dealing with just with that. We're also trying to bring some water to the trees and to the vegetation for biodiversity and to refresh the, vege the environment. So we're dealing with objectives which are in contradiction. So behind that, we'll need to uh, juggle with all the objectives to know what we want. And maybe in some location, we talked about uh, uh, green and blue uh, grid, so uh, there will be biodiversity, there will be patches, and we'll keep doing patches to have, uh, we will insist on these objectives, but there are sectors where we'll be more in floods with networks that will be uh, loaded, so we'll work on floods, and all those objectives will be toyed with. Again, we're just at the start of something that is taking place, so we still have all those questions open. And we didn't look at the distance uh, on over which we can transport water. We also base the idea on the results of the octu by saying that the, the the more water runs off, the more it is polluted. It loads with so when you can infuse the tree, you know that we save, we recharge the, the, the table. The tree will be able to uh, go, uh, will will. Uh, will bring, even for small rain, we can bring water to the tree when there is a drought. So all those are things which we, I mean, you know, more questions than answers, grant you that. So coming back to pollution questions, I don't know whether Sylvie Barreau is here. She worked a lot on that problem on, and micromedia, so she would be a better person to answer that question, especially when it comes to clogging. The idea is really to work on structures that are very simple, so an infiltration trench. When you go and see the infiltration trench and it's clogged, you can simply remove the stones, uh, clean it up and put it back into place, and that's the objective. So Sylvie, perhaps you would like to answer that question about pollution. Uh, no microphone. So yes, we did quite a lot of measurements as part of Lotus. We measured uh, the micro infiltration. So what we're seeing on the contrary is, is that this system, especially the plant system, it, it catches part of the pollution linked to runoff. And that's thanks to, uh, there are two types of phenomena. You limit the volumes at the outflow, so the volumes that are discharged at the exit to the system because uh, it's it's uh, captured by the, the system. So you, you pick up the water and the pollution at the same time, basically. And then when you have soil infiltration, there are infiltration processes that are very, very efficient, in fact. And so you pollute less, using micro infiltration in a diffuse manner rather than allowing the pollution to get into the systems and being uh, discharged into the natural environment there we go it's more benoit's team who worked on this but globally 
So this increase in terms of bacteria and diversity does not really lead to a higher level of pathogenic uh, organisms in the natural environment. They're not really pathogenic bacteria. Well, they might be for people with, with a problem uh, with their immune system. So um, yes, no clear answers yet. And then, of course, you have to put things into perspective when it comes to the results. And this is for a simple reason. Where we s take our samples, so we sample downstream of the infiltration system and behind that, if there's a water plume that continues, the water table will play its filtration role with the alluvial deposits. So there's the kind of a self-purification of the water that takes place. Well, to my knowledge, in Lyon, I don't think so. We haven't really been out there for a long time. In Chassieux, there's the Jongo Basin, where we've got a, a site uh, that is sealed off. There's that uh, spot then. But um, apart from that, we haven't really covered that an awful lot. So we've really centralized things on the basins. But, you know, when you work on several basins, when you look at the inlet waters, the runoff waters, so we worked on six basins that were quite different in terms of soil use. So either it was on the campus at the Dua, on the IUT basin, or in an industrial zone, there were surface communities that were quite similar. When we drained, when we drain urban surfaces, the signature that you get is quite clear in terms of the community of bacteria that you have in those systems. And we were actually quite surprised about that. But it's true that there are still many things to be done in this field. So my question is, well, all of these spaces have networks that are in more or less good condition, there might be leaks, and the communities might be different uh, if you take the sewage systems, for example. And I wondered, you know, what happens when, you know, you've got all of these geothermal systems, or you're heating up the water table, what about the water infiltration there? Will it help to decrease things? If you've got, you know, is that going to help to decrease the temperature of the water table and limit the development of bacteria that you might have otherwise? That's a very good question. We didn't have a chance to look at it, but there was Thierry Vinescu who worked on the underground city with the changes in flows uh, of the water table because there are big buildings, you know, big structures, so big underground structures, foundations supporting the buildings, and the, where there was a lot of geothermal, there were a lot of geothermal systems. I think it was in La Pardieu, and the effects were quite considerable, linked uh, certainly to heat pumps and discharge into the water table. So yes, it would be interesting to study these sites, I believe because to my knowledge, we don't, we're not very familiar with them. We don't know the impacts that this can have from a microbiological point of view in, in the city. So we'll uh, make a note to, to do that then at some point. <laughs> yeah, we could, we could. Um, so that's a very important theme. There are different points that we will be working on again. So we'll, so we'll get, uh, thank you, Leticia. We'll get Florian to do some more work. And if I can just, my name is Leticia Baco from the Grey and the O2. We have a collective work uh, supported by H2O Lyon, 
and it will be coming out on the 1st of June. It will look at all of the different knowledge that we have inside the observatory. Notably, there's a question dedicated to the underground city and the impact of water infiltration. And it's uh, Thierry Vignaski's work uh, that uh, was uh, the basis for that. Thank you.